Hello and welcome to another Renegade Economist talk show. This week it gives me great pleasure to welcome Anne Pettifor, uh, who is a leading author and commentator on all things economic. Uh, Anne is a director of Prime Economics, a fellow of the New Economics Foundation and co-author of the Green New Deal. And thank you for dropping by and taking the time to do this. Um, let me start by uh, saying that in 2003, you predicted an Anglo-American debt deflationary crisis. Yeah. Now, uh, a fair bit of vision uh, to do that in 2003. How did you get to that thinking? Well, I'd been working um, with uh, think tanks and NGOs on the debts of the poorest countries, sovereign debts. And the financial crisis uh, in 2007 was the culmination of a crisis that had begun much earlier, financial crisis that had begun in the 1970s. But it had begun on the periphery and in the poorest countries and gradually moved towards the core. And we had been working, I had been working, with the poorest countries in the world who'd become heavily indebted after the 1970s and who had debts that were never going to get repaid. And so we founded and led, I led a campaign called the Jubilee 2000 campaign yeah. for the cancellation of the debts of these sovereigns, saying that the debts were unpayable. Um, and we persuaded the IMF, the World Bank and the Paris Club of Creditors, which is the G G8 creditors, if you like, to write off about $100 billion of debt for 35 of the poorest countries. And what that had given me was a sort of eagle-eye view of what was happening in the world. And when I'd come home to Britain, people would be immersed in shopping and booming and, you know, house buying. But I was floating around Africa, Latin America. I had to go to Washington a lot. And I was across in Japan because we had a, a branch in Japan. And, and I was in... Um, Hong Kong in 1997 when the Southeast Asian uh, crisis broke. Yeah. Uh, I worked in Indonesia um, because Indonesia was one of the victims of that crisis, one of unintended victims really. And it was the privilege of this eagle eye view which yeah. enabled me in 2003 to look up from where I had been looking at the debts of the poorest countries and notice, wow, these are peanuts really look at how indebted the United States and Britain are compared to what are we worried about, you know? And I, I remember saying to the NGOs, for goodness sake, the real problem isn't, isn't in these periphery countries, it's at the core. And it was, so we then... Uh, I what, was then the, what was the reaction to that? We, we the reaction was, well, you know, loopy. We all know these, <laughs> these African governments are corrupt and they borrow too much money and they're incompetent. It's not true of Britain and the United States, you know. Um, and uh, so it was kind of dismissed. And then I, at the end of the campaign, I was exhausted. I traveled around the world. I, you know, I was completely knackered, actually. And I went to the New Economics Foundation for three years and more or less did a, a sort of informal PhD because I was desperate to understand why these countries had not built up levels of debt between 1940 and 1945 and 71, but that after 1971 they started again. Everyone blamed it on the OPEC oil crisis, but I couldn't quite see how that fitted. And that's when I began to read people like Eric Halina on the development of the global financial system post-war and got to understand that really it was the, the, the build-up of debt was uh, directly linked to the deregulation of credit. Um, and that had begun in when Nixon unilaterally bailed out of the Bretton Woods mm. in 1971. And here in Britain in 1971, we introduced something called competition and credit control, which is all competition and no, no control credit. over credit. Um, and that enabled the private banks to begin lending without anyone looking over their shoulders, without any limits on that lending. And it also, uh, f the ending of capital controls meant that central banks could no longer control the spectrum of interest rates, mm. i.e., you know, short or long, safe or risky. Um, they could only manage the base rate. And now the base rate is irrelevant. You know, when I take out a mortgage, it bears absolutely no relationship whatsoever to either what the Fed has set as the base rate or the, or the Bank of England. Anyway, I got to see all this, and it seemed to me blindingly obvious in 2003 that this was all going to fall down. And only the New Statesman took us seriously and, and did a cover. 
story on what we were warning of. And then in 2006, I began to get really desperate because people all around me were borrowing. They were going out taking crazy mortgages on when I knew... As in friends and... Friends and family, family you know, yeah. who, who, who weren't on secure incomes, who were artists or working in the media and, and whom I knew did not have secure jobs. <laughs> God forbid, working God, in the media. Exactly. And, uh, and they were taking out these hefty mortgages and nobody was asking too many questions and I could just see the whole thing falling down. So I wrote a book which the publishers called the, by the cheerful title The Coming First World Debt Crisis, just to say to my friends, look, guys, this is all going to fall down and you're going to be, you're going to have a lot of debt and you will not, you probably lose your job. That's quite a thing to do because not only are you saying to your friends, this is, you're in a whole world of trouble, you're a good friend, but you know, you, you're, you're not going to be painted as such at the time, were you? No. Because there is a prior element yeah. to people who have had a vision and, and been yes. right. Yes. Or not. Yeah. Is that a lonely position to take? Well, I mean, I don't think of it as a vision. I think of it as just analysing things correctly, mm-hmm. basically. Um, and it was lonely. Um, people thought I was rather loony. Um, and, you know, it just didn't go anywhere. And it's embarrassing when you can't sell your book, you know, or when you've only sold a few hundred copies of your book. And, and there's a lot more sold now. Um, and, you know, I'm not complaining because that book and the 2003 Real World Economic Outlook have done me a lot of good subsequently. Of course. It's unique, uh, your approach, um, if I may say that, because neoclassical economists come at everything, um, well, they specialise and specialise and specialise. Yeah. And they become so specialised on a very, very narrow remit that yes. they miss the whole picture. Yes. And I think it's called the silo mentality, if yes. you like. Yes. You've come at it with a holistic view. Yeah. Um, and we need more economists who can do that. Mm. The current academic system isn't birthing that. No. How do we start to put that right? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is get the finance sector's claws out of the academic world, basically. I mean, I think it's no accident that we're in silos. I think it's no accident that we're focused on the micro and ignoring the macro uh, because um, it, that suits the finance sector. It means they can go on doing as they please and, it, and economists and academics blithely are unaware of it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. No. And I, I don't like conspiracy theories. Um, but I think there is something very bizarre about the approach of academic of academia to, to finance. Uh, it's not just bizarre, it's also kind of quite easy to understand. Most economists now are hired guns. Yes. They don't have tenure. I mean, in America, there are a few economists who, do, who have tenure and who can therefore say true things. Uh, I think of Jeffrey Sachs and so on. And these people have got tenure so they can afford to say that which is not uh, mainstream. But most economists can't afford to do that. They too have mortgages. They too have to earn a living. And they are, they've been hired. And, and I think the, the way the academic system has been broken up to deny people tenure, uh, it, also not deliberate, uh, not accidental in my view, is one of the, the, the big flaws in that system. And if, you put, if we put our focus there, you yeah. think it's time well spent, really. It's a working surface, because if they haven't got tenure, and if uh, banks are funding think tanks and yes. universities... Uh, and, and research it, departments. And research departments. Yeah. And if you watch Charles Ferguson's excellent film, Inside Job, and, and you see the cowardice of those neoclassical economists at the yes. end who just blankly refuse to answer the questions... And then when they do are full of spite, yes. you get a so- kind of insight into the murky world that you're dealing with. No, absolutely. You've just come back from, is it the INET conference in yes, Berlin? Yes, in now, Berlin. Mr. Soros funds yes. this. Yes. H- how, could we, how, are, how are these conferences relevant? Because you said something really interesting about it, that they don't just shun all the, uh, the old guard, if you like. Yes. They actually mix the old guard with the guys coming through, yes. people like yourself, yes. Steve Keen, Michael Hudson, etc. Yes. Um, and, and put this all in the mix and and try and birth a new economic paradigm through this system. Yes, Otherwise, so do you think that's a way forward? Well, absolutely. You know, um, Mr. Soros is holding a pluralistic event. Yes. And that's where all good ideas come from, in the clash of ideas, in the clash of dialogue, you know. Um, monologues don't pre- create this, the, new, the new thinking or the new paradigm. 
So I really um, respect Mr. Soros for doing that. It, it's deeply annoying to have to sit and listen to stuff that you've heard over and over again. <laughs> but, um, but on the other hand, it's an opportunity to, to engage in dialogue with those people. And those people on the whole are not used to dialogue with anything, with anyone, sorry, who, who doesn't share their worldview. And that is so damaging. I am right now reading a speech by a man called Ben Broadbent, who's on the board of the Bank of England and who was at Goldman Sachs and who's written a paper saying that um, the cause of the crisis had absolutely nothing to do with easy money, i.e. unregulated money. Uh, it had everything to do with the fact that interest rates were incredibly low. <laughs> now, when I read that paper, it is so, um, it is so deceptive, really, and yet it's packed with uh, charts and, and data and some sourcing of information. He, is, he, he, he does neglect to give us the source of some of his data. That, that paper, as I'm convinced, has been written in Goldman Sachs's research department, and he's delivered the speech on behalf of Goldman Sachs, and he's on the board of the Bank of England. Now, um, you know, that's not a conspiracy. No. It's huge political and economic power. And um, those of us who have an alternative view don't have that sort of backing and don't have those sorts of platforms. And that's very damaging for public discourse, for the pluralism of the debate. When those Goldman Sachs bankers, if ever conscience does creep in, yeah. and there isn't a moment where they think, God, you know, we know hiding the Greeks, Greek debts, hiding the Italian debt, yeah, yeah. getting involved in these egregious rip-off schemes, yes. do you think there's ever a moment where they think soberly, do you know what, this isn't great? I think... I mean, I was reading Broadbent's speech, and I was a bit st stunned by it, really. He says in it that for every saver, there is a borrower. Now, this is a man who's on the board of the Bank of England and has no idea, it seems, that we live in a monetary system and have lived in a monetary system since 1694. Together with the Dutch and the Italians, we pioneered a bank money system which is based on credit. Mm. And yet he suggests, and dear old Tim Geithner has as well, that that we our banking system relies on people to deposit some savings in the bank and then mm. to lend it out. And if that were the case, we would never have had a credit crisis, you know. And yet this man is on the board of the Bank of England. Now, I think they are so deep inside their framework, inside of their Ptolemaic view of the world, yes, if you like, yes. inside their creationist view of the world, as opposed to a Darwinian view of the yeah, world, well, yeah. that they can't see outside of it. Now, we all know people like that, mm. with sort of, who are blindsided by their view of the world. Um, but they tend not to be academics or members of the board of the Bank of England. They tend to be... People who are not educated or people, you know, who, who haven't been trained in, in academic thought and so on. So it, it, is, it is extraordinary. But I think, so therefore I don't think it's a matter of them deliberately deceiving or being mor amoral compared to you and me. I just think they are frozen in a way of thinking. But what I think is amoral is the fact that the banks finance this that they churn this stuff out in order to defend. What Mr. Broadbent is doing as we speak is defending the ability of Goldman Sachs to lend without regulation and to lend at very high rates of interest. His speech is about, please may we raise the rate of interest. Mm -hmm. For me, this is a huge fundamental issue, the rate of interest. And I'm something that my fellow uh, heterodox economists, in my view, don't take seriously enough. If you're a a producer of real things, of goods and services. In the real economy. In the real economy. You want to grow wind farms because you know the climate change is coming and you want to do something risky and adventurous because you know the world is going to change. To get a loan to do that means that you have to get a loan at a rate of interest which enables you to take that risk, to make that investment, perhaps make a loss, but in the future make a profit. You know, so if you were sort of inventing the steam engine in the Industrial Revolution, right. you'd want someone to lend you some money to take that risk around the steam engine, which would enable you to experiment and make mistakes, but come through because you knew the future of the world was steam. Um, the banks, on the other hand, don't want to make loans at rates of interest which will enable 
Mr. Watts or Mr. Wind Farm uh, in, uh, inventor to, to make progress. They want to make rates of interest which give them a return on an effortless activity, which is entering a number into a ledger and making a loan. That's what they do. That's mm. their business. They don't even manage Mrs. Jones's savings, mm. as we've found out. They simply enter numbers into ledgers or they engage in speculative activities like derivatives and CDOs and so on. And from that, they make very large sums of money and they want to charge rent on that process. And that rent has to be high. So in our economy, we have this great bifurcation between the interests of the banks and the interest of the real world. And Mr. Broadbent is on the Bank of England board in order to promote the interests of the banks and in order to get interest rates higher. Yeah. And that's going to destroy people in the productive economy. It's also going to um, lead to a dark age, arguably. I mean, I don't want to be too grand and sensational oh. about that. But if you want renaissance, you want to unleash human potential. Yeah. And to do that, you need a uh, banking system that's fit for purpose. Right. There's a dreadful statistic, um, and I'd like your view on it. Um, uh, and we may have covered the ground, but only 8% of loans last year were actually, from banks were actually put into the real, were used for real business investment in the UK. Yeah. Um, now, you, I've seen you, know, you speak, and you've had graphs of the difference between money that has been created and, and the real economy. And there's an awful, there's a big difference between there. There's an awful lot of money about. Yes. How do we strategically take that money and put it where it needs to go? Which control the banks. We have to regulate the banks. Yeah. Now, right now, and, and you know, we know how to do this. It's been done before. So, so walk me through it. What do we do today? So, so what we should do today yeah. is what Keynes and Roosevelt and all those good people in the 30s did then. Yeah. They had a banking system out of control. They had globalization on a bigger scale than we have, actually. There was more migration, for example, then. And um, they had globalization. They had an a, a uncontrolled credit system. This meant they lent money like there was no tomorrow to people who wanted to buy stocks of shares on the New York Stock Exchange. And people went crazy. Okay, And they borrowed on the margin and all of that stuff. And, and eventually, the whole thing blew up. And they borrowed at rates of interest that caused the thing to blow up. So Mr. Keynes and others came together and said, look, what we have to do is manage the financial system. If we manage that, we can manage the real economy. And they, first of all, introduced capital controls. You cannot manage the spectrum of interest rates, short and long, safe and risky, mm -hmm. and the real, the real cost of borrowing, i.e. when inflation is taken into account, yeah. unless you manage the flow of capital across borders. If I can borrow at... 3% in China, yes. why should I borrow from my local bank at 4%? So what we find is that by having capital mobility, banks go around the world searching for cheap money. Um, we need capital control so that we can manage the price of money in our economy. And that's what they did in the 1930s. They introduced capital controls against the will of the banks and of the finance sector. And Rousseau felt, you know, had a huge fight with Wall Street over this. Once you did that, you then were able to control interest rates. The second thing you need to do is to, and you need to bring them down low. I mean, Keynes's whole um, general theory was about how we need permanently low interest rates. And today we know we need permanently low interest rates, not just to help Mr. Wind Farm inventor, but also because in ecological terms, we can't afford to keep extracting assets mm. from the earth at you know um, exponential rates of return, which is what you need to do. If your loan is 8%, you've got to make a profit of 10% in order to pay back your loan and then keep a bit aside to pay wages and look after yourself, or maybe even 15% mm. in order to pay back your loan. That means you've got to strip more forest, you've got to dig more fish out of the sea. And put sea. it down to externalities and put it because, down to, because the margins are so tight. Exactly. Because your initial capital is, is predatory. It's t been taken by the banks. So, so we need to have capital controls to control interest rates, and then we need to control the creation of credit. You, the banks must be told, in no uncertain terms, you may lend for productive purposes, but you may not lend for speculative purposes. Right. You can't lend to a gambler, but you can lend to someone who's going to do something real with his, his money. In the real economy. And employ people. And create and, value. And cre create value and create goods and services that we now desperately need. need. Okay. Yeah. So, and the, so those are the steps. And in fact, you know, those, if you, we, capital controls, interest rates, low interest rates, control of the creation of credit. Um, 
you know, there is no shortage of money in a, in a monetary system. Yeah. That's the joy of it. I, I've worked in Africa where they don't have banking systems and where they don't have a proper credit system, where people don't have credit cards and where people can't get loans. I've been in Hanoi in Vietnam where it's not possible to get a mortgage. And so nobody, you have to save for the whole of your life to buy a house. So what happens is people inherit their parents' homes and they don't move. Right? There are no mortgages in, in Hanoi. Mm. Um, and so we in, in countries which have sophisticated banking systems and credit systems are incredibly privileged. It's what's driven, it's what drove the Renaissance. The Florentines worked out a banking system and that led to the Renaissance. The Dutch, you know, it, uh, developed the system further. That led to a great uh, flowering of their economy. The this establishment of the Bank of England and our banking system here led to the Industrial Revolution. Mm. Um, so, you know, a, a well-managed monetary system is a great civilizational advance, but it has to be managed. And at the moment, the bankers have made sure that it's not managed. All this comes down to a corridor of uncertainty, if you like, because the bankers say, it's not us, it's the politicians. The politicians yes. say, it's not us, our hands are tied, and we're, we're and all, uh, I suppose, uh, overarching theory is the free market, which of yes. course isn't. Yes. Um, to give this uh, talk show uh, topicality, uh, last night we heard a, a Conservative MP say that the two posh boys running the UK at the moment don't know the price of milk. Yes. And but um, I would um, posit this that they do that they nor do they know the price of milking the, the society that we live in. Yes. F on behalf of the banks. Yeah. If you don't have that political leadership in place, yes. where do we get the will, political will, to implement what you have just yeah. suggested, which is eminently sensible? Yes. The thing is, I'm with the bankers on this one. It is the politicians' fault. Now, the bankers have bribed and uh, co-opted and captured the politicians, but it's their fault for being bribed and captured. Okay. You, ca you can resist that sort of temptation. And we have had powerful politicians in history like Roosevelt, mm. who did deny, who didn't take the bribe, basically, and who didn't fall for the game. And then we've had politicians like those in Germany in the 1930s, who fell for the finance sector's uh, uh, approaches. And, you know, in, in, in America, we had the New Deal, progress, democracy, and in Europe, we had fascism. So um, I blame the politicians for falling for all of this. And, and from a point of view of, of civil society, you know, we can do very little about Goldman Sachs. We can't walk in there and take it over as, as, as a people, as a democracy. Uh, we, can't, I mean, we can't even, it seems, manage the uh, bonus of, of one of our managers of the, the Royal Bank of Stockland, which apparently the public own. Um, because of the weakness of our politicians. But what we can do yes. is we can hold our politicians to account. And the problem with, with, with us has been is that the public, and this is what, why what you're doing is so valuable, is the public's been ignorant. You, you know, if academics don't understand how the financial system works, then God help the rest of us, you know. And, but my, my experience is that once the public understand, there's no stopping them. Um, when I started Jubilee 2000, everybody said to me, you're crazy. You can't run a, a global campaign on sovereign debt and finance, the international financial. Nobody will understand <laughs> it. And what do they care for? Anyway, everybody's so selfish, I was told. They only care about the me, me, me generation. And in the middle of the me, me, me generation, we launched a campaign to cancel the debts of the poorest countries. And it was quite complicated. We had to explain to people about multilateral debt, bilateral debt, commercial debt, the distinctions, foreign exchange, the impact of you know, currency movements on the value of the debt and so on. Net present value of the debt. I mean, you try explaining net present value to an audience of 500 people, church people, you know, Tough. not easy. Tough. But you know, people are not stupid. They got it. They got it. And once they got it, they internalized it. And boy, there was no stopping them. People asked us, where the hell did this movement come from? And where it came from was when people understood it. There was just no... We didn't organize them. They organized themselves. So I'm confident that once people understand how the system works and know that banks create money out of thin air by entering a number into a ledger, um, then, then they begin to understand that this is free money, 
which shouldn't cost us anything, and that they're charging a rent on this free money, which is exorbitant and unjust, and something must be done about it. And then we must explain that the politicians deregulated. They changed the rules. They changed the rules. They can change the rules back again. It's quite easy to do. And don't let anyone tell you, oh, we live in a digital age and it's not possible. No. No. I can tell you that in, 19, in the 1930s, it was just as tricky to take on the bankers as it is now. And they did, because they had courage and guts and determination. And they could see Hitler coming over the hill. Now, you talk about what was said in our, in our House of Commons last night. Yesterday, one in five French people voted for the fascists. I've just been to Berlin and I saw that in 19... 30, three years before he became uh, leader of, 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 of Germany, the fascists had 18% uh, of the share of the vote. Miss Le Pen in France now has more than 18%. Mm, yes, yes. Of the French. You know, what we are facing is that possibility. 35% of her support, 35% of working class people in France voted for fascists in on, in Sunday's elections. And they did that because they're desperate, yes. because they're losing their jobs, because yes. they can see that things are getting worse and they can see the bankers doing really, really well. And they can't articulate and they can't, what the problem is. They can't articulate that, but she is saying and, there is a big problem and, and I care about you. And Hitler said the same. Mm. And he, you know, deeply dishonest, all kinds of things wrong, but he said exactly the same to the Germans in 19, between 1919 and 1930, and they believed him. And look what we got for that, you know. So the, there is a huge amount at stake here. Yeah. And I personally am deeply gloomy because on the same day that one in five French people voted for fascists, Mr. Weidmann, who is the governor of the bank, uh, the Bundesbank in Germany, said, there is no alternative. Right. Now, there is, and you've fleshed it out. Yeah. Lots of other economists have fleshed it out. We've made a film about it. There's lots of people talking about it. And yeah. when a mass of people mobilise behind that message, there's the alternative. Absolutely. All right, so we, we've got to park the gloominess. Yes. So what do we do? So what we do now is we, we get a grip on this stuff. Yeah. We, we, I mean, what I would do if I was out there and I was learning about this, I would read the newspapers. I would buy the Financial Times and, and try and understand everything. I would get a grip on what was happening, number one. Number two, I would go and see my politician. Yeah. And I would say, I don't like what you guys are doing, and I want you to rein in the bankers. And if you don't rein in the bankers, I'm not voting for you. Right, so we get clued up. Yes, and I, I want to say this. Yeah. You know, people who have the views that we have tend to be slightly anarchic and, you know, uh, left of centre and uh, on the fringes and so on and I'm thinking of the Occupy movement and so on, they tend to not like politics, and nor do I like politics. It's pretty damn ugly, let's face it. But the only way we're going to get change is by changing the rules, and the only way to change the rules is political. You can't change the rules by, by you know, just getting off on your, you know, sitting Signing in, a, po a petition no. and saying, oh, you know, and then sending it to your... I mean, yeah, you yeah. have to get politically involved. Yeah. We have to have political organisation. We may... Uh, we have to join political parties. I'm not recommending which one people Would should Would you join. create your own? I, th I think it's hard to create a new party from the start, given we haven't very much time. Mm. I think there are progressive parties in Britain who are capable of taking this message. Um, I'm not going to name them. No, I think fine. we should make all our make up choices. our own yes. minds about that. Um, and what we ought to do is get inside the parties and say, hang on, guys, you're listening to the bankers. You should be listening to us. And, and that's, you know, people worry about that. But I think we've got to dirty our hands and become political in order to achieve change. We get clued up. And we can. We get clued up. Yep. We read the FT, we read The Economist, we read as, mu <clears throat> as much as we can. Yes. We re-engage. And the web. That's so wonderful so wonderful. Well, there's, and the there's web. the democratisation of yeah. information. Absolutely. Uh, and that could arguably birth some kind of renaissance. Yeah. Um, no, we, I, especially I, when the education's been sold out to the free free market. Exactly. No, no. And so there's a great deal to be hopeful about. So we've gone from gloom to uh, uh, absolute the sunny I, utopia of hope. I, you know... I'm an optimist, you know. I started with the problem of, of the debts, 300, I mean, the poor countries owed $350 billion. 
We started in a shed on the roof of Christian Aid. <laughs> and, and it had, There's not many people who can say that. No, and it had a corrugated wall, which didn't quite come down to the floor, and the drafts would blow our feet away in the winter. And, uh, and we had no supporters. And we began a campaign, and at the end we had, a cam- we had campaigns in 60 countries around the world. And Clinton and the Pope and Bono and all of that crap all came round to the view you had to write off the debt. Yes. I, mean, I know Bono's out of fashion at the moment, but... You know, he played a really good role in all that. But, and so did President Clinton, and so did um, Blair and Brown, ultimately. And they should be praised for that. And they should be praised for that, you see. And what we did was we built up the pressure valve, uh, but we put the pressure on the politicians. It's very interesting that at the time there was the anti-globalization movement going on. And they all aimed at Washington, the IMF, and the World Bank. Now, the IMF and the World Bank are two massive bureaucracies, packed full of civil servants, some of them brilliant, most of them with two PhDs, but civil servants nevertheless. Civil servants can't change the world. We took a different tack. We aimed at the politicians who sat on the board of the IMF and the World Bank. They can change the world. They could change the rules. They had to change the rules which enabled the debt to be written off. And it was that different focus, I think, which gave us a result. And I saw that happen, and I know it can happen again. So I am positive. Done. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. Pleasure. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Anne Pettifor, uh, and another uh, absolutely fantastic renegade economist talk show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, do join us again uh, when we can bring guests of this calibre, uh, and, um, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to another Renegade Economist talk show. This week it gives me great pleasure to welcome Anne Pettifor, uh, who is a leading author and commentator on all things economic. Uh, Anne is a director of Prime Economics, a fellow of the New Economics Foundation and co-author of The Green New Deal. And thank you for dropping by and taking the time to do this. Um, let me start by uh, saying that in 2003 you predicted an Anglo-American debt deflationary crisis. Yeah. Now, uh, a fair bit of vision uh, to do that in 2003. How did you get to that thinking? Well, I'd been working um, with uh, think tanks and NGOs on the debts of the poorest countries, sovereign debts. And the financial crisis uh, in 2007 was the culmination of a crisis that had begun much earlier, financial crisis that had begun in the 1970s. But it had begun on the periphery and in the poorest countries, and gradually moved towards the core. And we had been working, I had been working, with the poorest countries in the world who'd become heavily indebted after the 1970s, and who had debts that were never going to get repaid. And so we founded and led, I led a campaign called the Jubilee 2000 campaign yeah. for the cancellation of the debts of these sovereigns, saying that the debts were unpayable. Um, and we persuaded the IMF, the World Bank, and the Paris Club of Creditors, which is the G2, G8 creditors, if you like, to write off about $100 billion of debt for 35 of the poorest countries. And what that had given me was a sort of eagle-eye view of what was happening in the world. And when I'd come home to Britain, people would be immersed in shopping and booming and, you know, house buying. But I was floating around Africa, Latin America. I had to go to Washington a lot. And I, it, yes, I not. Yeah. Is that a lonely position to take? Well, I mean, I don't think of it as a vision. I think of it as just analysing things correctly, mm-hmm. basically. Um, and it was lonely. Um, people thought I was rather loony. Um, and, you know, it just didn't go anywhere. And it's embarrassing when you can't sell your book, you know, or when you've only sold a few hundred copies of your book. And, and there's a lot more sold now. Um, and... You know, I'm not complaining because that book and the 2003 Real World Economic Outlook have done me a lot of good subsequently. Of course. It's unique, uh, your approach, um, if I may say that, because neoclassical economists come at everything, um, well, they specialise and specialise and specialise. And they become so specialised on a very, very narrow remit that they miss the whole picture. And I think it's called the silo mentality, if you like. You've come at it with a holistic view. Yeah. Um, and we need more economists who can do that. Mm. The current academic system isn't birthing that. No. How do we start to put that right? 
Well, I think the first thing we have to do is get the finance sector's claws out of the academic world, basically. I mean, I think it's no accident that we're in silos. I think it's no accident that we're focused on the micro and ignoring the macro. Uh, because um, it, that suits the finance sector. It means they can go on doing as they please, and, it, and economists and academics blithely are unaware of it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. No. And I, I don't like conspiracy theories. Um, but I think there is something very bizarre about the approach of, academic, of academia to, to finance. Uh, it's not just bizarre, it's also kind of quite easy to understand. Most economists now are hired guns. Yes. They don't have tenure. I mean, in America, there are a few economists who, do, who have tenure and who can therefore say true things. Mm. In 1971, and here in Britain in 1971, we introduced something called competition and credit control, which is all competition and no, no control credit. over credit. Um, and that enabled the private banks to begin lending without anyone looking over their shoulders without any limits on that lending and it also uh, f the ending of capital controls meant that central banks could no longer control the spectrum of interest rates mm. i.e. you know short or long safe or risky um, they could only manage the base rate and now the base rate is irrelevant you know when I take out a mortgage it bears absolutely no relationship whatsoever to either what the Fed has set as the base rate or the, or the Bank of England. Anyway, I got to see all this, and it seemed to me blindingly obvious in 2003 that this was all going to fall down. And only the New Statesman took us seriously and, and did a cover story on what we were warning of. And then in 2006, I began to get really desperate because people all around me were borrowing they were going out taking crazy mortgages on when I knew... As in friends and... Friends and family, family you know, yeah. who, who, who weren't on secure incomes, who were artists or working in the media and, and whom I knew did not have secure jobs. <laughs> God forbid, working God, in the media. Exactly. And, uh, and they were taking out these hefty mortgages and nobody was asking too many questions and I could just see the whole thing falling down. So I wrote a book which the publishers called, the, by the cheerful title, The Coming First World Debt Crisis, just to say to my friends, look, guys, this is all going to fall down and you're going to be, you're going to have a lot of debt and you will not, you probably lose your job. That's quite a thing to do, because not only are you saying to your friends, this is, you're in a whole world of trouble, you're a good friend, but you know, you, you're, you're not going to be painted as such at the time, were you? No. Because there is a pariah element yeah. to people who have had a vision and, and been yes, right. Yes, it was across in Japan because we had a, a branch in Japan, and, and I was in um, Hong Kong in 1997 when the Southeast Asian uh, crisis broke. Yeah. Uh, I worked in Indonesia um, because Indonesia was one of the victims of that crisis, one of unintended victims, really. And it was the privilege of this eagle eye view, which yeah. enabled me in 2003 to look up from where I had been looking at the debts of the poorest countries and notice, wow, these are peanuts, really look at how indebted the United States and Britain are compared to what are we worried about, you know? And I, I remember saying to the NGOs, for goodness sake, the real problem isn't, isn't in these periphery countries, it's at the core. And it was, so we then... Uh, I what, was then the, what was the reaction to that? We, we the reaction was, well, you know, loopy. We all know these, <laughs> these African governments are corrupt and they borrow too much money and they're incompetent. It's not true of Britain and the United States, you know. Um, and uh, so it was kind of dismissed. And then I, at the end of the campaign, I was exhausted. I travelled around the world. I, you know, I was completely knackered, actually. And I went to the New Economics Foundation for three years and more or less did a, a sort of informal PhD because I was desperate to understand why these countries had not built up levels of debt between 1940 and 1945 and 71, but that after 1971 they started again. Everyone blamed it on the OPEC oil crisis, but I couldn't quite see how that fitted. And that's when I began to read people like Eric Halina on the development of the global financial system post-war and got to understand that really it was the, the, the build-up of debt was uh, directly linked to the deregulation of credit. Mm. 
Um, and that had begun in when Nixon unilaterally bailed out of the Bretton Woods. Mm. Uh, I think of Jeffrey Sachs and so on. And these people have got tenure so they can afford to say that which is not uh, mainstream. But most economists can't afford to do that. They too have mortgages. They too have to earn a living. And they are, they've been hired. And, and I think the, the way the academic system has been broken up to deny people tenure, uh, also not deliberate, uh, not accidental in my view, is one of the, the, the big flaws in that system. And if, you put, if we put our focus there, you yeah. think it's time well spent, really. It's a working surface, because if they haven't got tenure, and if uh, banks are funding think tanks and yes. universities... Uh, and, and research it, departments. And research departments. Yeah. And if you watch Charles Ferguson's excellent film, Inside Job, and, and you see the cowardice of those neoclassical economists at the yes. end who just blankly refuse to answer the questions, and then when they do are full of spite, yes. you get a so kind of insight into the murky world that you're dealing with. No, absolutely. You've just come back from, is it the INET conference in yes, Berlin? Yes, in now, Berlin. Mr. Soros funds yes. this. Yes. How, could we, how, are, how are these conferences relevant? Because you said something really interesting about it, that they don't just shun all the, uh, the old guard, if you like. Yes. They actually mix the old guard with the guys coming through, yes. people like yourself, yes. Steve Keen, Michael Hudson, etc. Yes. Um, and, and put this all in the mix and, and try and birth a new economic paradigm through this system. Yes, Otherwise, So do you think that's a way forward? Well, absolutely. You know, um, Mr. Soros is holding a pluralistic event. Yes. And that's where all good ideas come from, in the clash of ideas, in the clash of dialogue, you know. Um, monologues don't pre create this, the, new, the new thinking or the new paradigm. So I really um, respect Mr. Soros for doing that. It, it's deeply annoying to have to sit and listen to stuff that you've heard over and over again. <laughs> but, um, but on the other hand, it's an opportunity to, to engage.